Tonight I'm going to be sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learned in my life. And I want to specifically hit you right in the heart and talk to you about the lessons that I've taken with me from being an undergrad and an active member of Black Cat Theta. In my life, I've always pushed against the odds. And when I was born, the doctors told my parents that I would be dead within the first 24 hours of my life. I'm happy to report that 37 years later, all those doctors are dead. <laughs> but that doesn't really go over the hospital system, actually. And I'm the only doctor that remains. And so, you're going to face a lot of odds in your life. You're going to face a lot of challenges. But I've always been a big picture thinker, and I've not listened to my critics or my haters, and I don't recommend that you do the same. I, I think it's important that you not listen to those critics and haters, because they will hold you back. They will weigh you down. And I've been a rambunctious human being my whole life. You know, when I was 12 years old, I had a very clear picture for what I wanted from my life. Let me take you back to that moment. I was in my living room. And I was watching this man come onto the television. And they were playing this song. You probably heard this song before. It goes like this. Ba -da 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 -da. Anybody know what that is? Kevin yeah, Lynch, you know? Yep, yeah, it's Hail the Chief. And when do they play Hail the Chief? When the President of the United States walks out. When I'm 12 years old and I'm in my living room and I'm watching this man come out on the stage and everybody just jumps to their feet and they start applauding and I'm thinking, I gotta have that job. <laughs> I want to be applauding with that kind of excitement when I come to work. Now I went to school that next day and I went to all my teachers and I told them, I just want you to know, I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to become a future president of these United States of America. Now let me ask you, when you tell people you're lofty goals, do they get right behind it? Do they go, yes you are? No, no, no. When you tell somebody your lofty goals, they usually go, oh, Smoothie. <laughs> Smoothie, pump the brakes. That's what my teacher said. They said, Sean, that's, that's pretty big. I mean, President of the United States. I didn't care. I didn't listen. I was determined to get to the top in my life and become the President of the United States. So I learned that there was a lot of things that I had to do to become President of the United States. First of all, you got to learn about geography, you got to learn about economics, you got to learn about human relations, you got to know how to pay people off. There's just a lot <laughs> you got to learn to be President of the United States. And the biggest thing that I learned was you got to be 35. I was 12. I had some time. Okay? So as the years went by, I kept holding on to this vision of becoming President of the United States. Finally, I get to college, and I've been telling people, the whole time, I'm going to become president. And if you ever have a vision for your life, and you tell people you're going to do something, if you don't have any results to show for it, people they stop believing in you. So I needed some traction on my goal. So I thought, if I'm going to work, you know, if I'm going to live in the White House someday, I might as well go to work there first. So I applied to work there. And I remember the day the envelope came in the mail to tell me whether or not I had been selected to work in the White House, and I got that envelope. Have you ever got a raise of hands? Have you ever received a piece of mail or a telephone call or an email where the verdict of that message would change the course of your life? Raise it up high. Yeah. It's like when you're holding that envelope and you're going, I'm not the father, I'm not the father. <laughs> I know who you are. And <laughs> I, know, I hold this envelope up to my nose. And it's from the White House. And when you get a letter from the White House, it comes in this beautiful white envelope with just blue letters in the corner saying, the White House. I hold it up to my nose. As if my nose was going to tell me the truth. And I'm sniffing this envelope. Oh, yeah. And I opened it up, and it's a letter. And it said, congratulations, Sean Stevenson. You've been selected to work in the White House alongside the President of the United States. You'll be showing up in three months. We look forward to seeing you. Now, my heart is racing out of my chest. 
I am so excited. I'm an undergrad at this time. I was applying to work there as an intern. And it was so exciting because after I took that envelope, I put it in my pocket and I went to campus the next day. And I went up to all the ladies. And I was like, what are you doing this summer? <laughs> well, you're not doing much. Can I show you what I'm doing? And I loved working at the warehouse. There were so many amazing things. I remember my first day on the job. I was just roaming the halls. And I was thinking about all the powerful leaders that have sculpted this nation. Think about all the social issues and the things that we've broken through as a human race were all discussed in these amazing halls of the White House. But there was something I, I absolutely loved about working at the White House. And that was watching the president come home from being overseas. See, when the president would come home from being overseas, he would land at Andrews Air Force Base, Air Force One, a giant 747. But then to get from the airport to the White House, he didn't just show up like you and I did, in an SUV, minivan, no. He shows up in a helicopter. And it's not just any helicopter. This thing is the size of a school bus, and it's dark green, with a big, bright, white stripe on the top, and an American flag painted on the side. And it's got these rotors that you can hear coming from miles. This thing is about as macho as they come. It's called Marine One. And I'm thinking, you know what would be amazing? Is if I was in the backyard when the president landed, and I greeted him as he came home. I mean, a helicopter landing, a little guy in a wheelchair. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> Don't get ahead of me. And so I'm in the White House, and I'm thinking, I got to have a reason to be out there. Now, I just can't pop out, so I got to look official, right? So I grab this envelope that looked really important. I put it on my arm, and I put on my busy face. You guys know what your busy face is? It looks like a combination of you have diabetes and constipation at the same time. <laughs> and, and I just look so busy. And nobody wants to bother a busy person because they might get that diarrhea and constipation look themselves. So they back off, right? So I'm taking this envelope, and I can see the president's schedule, my schedule, finally lined up. And off in the distance, I can see out the window, like, the helicopter is approaching. And I can hear this thing. And I am so excited. That 12-year-old boy that had that vision of being the President of the United States, he was excited, he was ready to greet the President. So I get to the South Lawn entrance. And no one is going out. And the doors are closed. And there's no handicap buttons. You know those handicap buttons that when, when you hit them, the doors open? You know, when you're carrying lots of pizza and you hit it with your butt, you're like, oh, that's so convenient. <laughs> They're not for you, okay? <laughs> but if I could digress for a moment, you know the bigger stall in the bathroom? That's not your dressing room. It's not. The, I'll let it go, I'll forgive you. Okay, so here I am. The doors are closed, there's not these handicap buttons. I'm in college at the time. And I'm thinking, Sean, you gotta get through those doors. So I'm thinking, you are an educated man, you're in college, you've learned things, what do you remember that can get you through these doors? And then I realized, there's something called momentum. <laughs> physics, gentlemen, physics. I'm about 55 pounds of love, the wheelchair's another 20, so I'm thinking, if I just get enough running room, I can get up to 88 miles per hour and slam into these doors. So I'm like, I'm pumping myself up. I'm like, you got nothing, son. You got nothing. And I can take off. Boom. Boom. Bam. These doors fly open. Now, what I didn't expect is what would happen next. This giant wall of wind slammed into my face and blew me back into the White House. And I'm like, ah, how did you know? And then I'm huffing. And I'm huffing. And I get outside. And I'm like, whew, that was easy. Ever got a little cocky because you achieved something? No, of course not. But have you heard about this thing called cocky? Yeah, it's when you achieve something and you think you've made it, but you have just begun. I'm outside and I'm thinking about all those suckers inside that aren't going to even greet the president as he comes out of the helicopter. And right when I am at my 
most proud moment, I noticed something off in the distance. One of the trees was moving in a different direction than all the other trees. I look a little closer, and I see 12 men in all black military fatigue. They're climbing down ropes, and they're running at me with submachine guns. I'm glad you think that's funny. <laughs> and I look down at my chest, and I see blue red laser dots. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not good. Now, I don't know how perceptually aware you are, gentlemen, but I can't run, okay? But I'm thinking, this is not good. I need to get to the helicopter, get to the chopper, what was in my head, right? And I'm seeing these guards going down. You know who these guards are? They're not the secret service. They're one level above the secret service. They're the emergency response team. They don't ask questions. They do whatever it takes. And I'm thinking, I gotta get to that helicopter. I take off at full speed for that helicopter. And I'm getting this helicopter. The door swings open. The President of the United States steps, steps out and he looks at me. And everything stops. And that's when I realized, gentlemen, you better have a vision for your life. You better have a very clear picture for where you want your life to be. What kind of relationships do you want to have in your life? What kind of business would you like to be a part of someday? What kind of chapter do you want to complete your education with? Because most of life is going to be a distraction. There will be more distractions thrown at you than you can imagine. And the people that climb to the top in whatever area it is are the ones that have a very clear vision. And anything that doesn't support their vision, they just respectfully decline. And I've seen this over the course of my life. I've seen the people that hold their vision very clear are the ones that are pulled into their future. But sadly, most of the human race is not pulled by a vision. You know what most of the human race does? This is what I'm going to beg you not to do in your life. They don't have a clue what they want for their life. But if you ask most people on the street out there, what do you want? They'll say, I don't even know. I'll tell you what I don't want. And then they'll give you a very clear definition of what they don't want. I don't want to be broke. I don't want to be fat. I don't want to be divorced. I don't want to be this. I don't want to be that. And they tell you in very clear definition what they don't want for their life. You know what? That's the equivalent of? That's the equivalent of walking backwards into your future, looking at what you don't want. I don't want this. I don't want that. Well, let me ask you, how successful can you walk backwards? It's not an easy process. You bump into things. You get off course. You get far away from where you want to be. Gentlemen, I really want you to spend time with your vision for your life. Be that weirdo that pulls out a journal and writes down clearly where you want to be in 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. And it doesn't mean that that's exactly where you'll end up. It just means you have something pulling you into your future as opposed to just going away from things. The mistakes I've made in my life are the places that I wasn't clear enough what I wanted. What I love about my experience of being in the fraternity is because I, I was very clear in my vision of why I wanted to join Phi Kappa Theta. Why I wanted to join is because when I got to campus, I went to DePaul University, I didn't know anybody. And I didn't like that feeling. You know that feeling when you walk into a room and you don't know a soul? And you're like, gosh, where's my tribe? Where are the people who are going to watch my back? Where are the people who are going to tell me what burrito place to not go to after midnight? <laughs> Where are the people who are going to hold my hand and, and let me know it's going to be okay if somebody I love dies? And when I got to campus, I went to that activity fair 1997, and I met all the different fraternities. And the reason 
my choice Phi Kappa Theta was because it was the only fraternity that looked me right in the eye and said, we go out to get to know you. I remember going over the first night, they had like a spaghetti dinner, and I showed up and like everybody introduced themselves. I was so excited, I mean, free spaghetti, right? <laughs> I was excited because I felt like these individuals wanted to get to know me. And I loved the president at the time. He was a senior when I was a freshman. And he sat me down. He was very serious. He said, Sean, we see something in you. We want you in this fraternity. And I said, what do you see? He said, we see really good parking privileges. <laughs> Because he was willing to have a playful dialogue and not treat me as special, but treat me just like everybody. I was, I was dealt with just like every new freshman that was there. There was teasing, there was play, there was respect, it was all of it. I thought, this is where I belong. And they even said what I really admired about Phi Kappa Theta is they said, go to all the other dinners. See our competition. Go meet everybody. And if you click better with somebody else, then we'd love for you to join them. But we think you're going to feel best here. And I think I remember going to all the different camp, all the different houses on campus and thinking like, I'm not feeling welcome here, I'm not feeling welcome. And then it was just that feeling of when I stepped into the Phi Kappa Theta house, I was at home. Raise your hand if you can relate to that. Yeah, because that's what this is really. This is a home because I don't know that many of you. I see a few familiar faces, but I'm basically coming back into a room of people that I don't know. But the difference is we share those three letters. So I feel welcome because I know that we have common goals and I know that we're on this planet to make a difference. What I love about being a side cat in, in an undergrad it's the mentorship of that president and all the executive board at the time. I remember spending time with the upperclassmen. One of them taught me about the importance of rolling up your sleeves and with humility. And it doesn't matter what job it is. If you're clearing off plates after a dinner, or if you're introducing yourself to new recruits, or whatever it may be, you bring that same level of humility still just as much the case when you're in business years later. The mentorship that I got when I was in Phi Kappa Theta really it inspired me to take on mentors in life. I've built a very successful business over the past 22 years. I have been blessed to share the stage with U.S. Presidents and the Dalai Lama and see some of the most amazing, massive crowds that you can imagine. And it's all been built through mentorship. I have 22 mentors. I call them my advocate circles. In my advocate circle, these are individuals that believe in me. And these are individuals that I believe in. And no matter what business, if you want to go into social service or any level of life, I recommend that you seek out mentors, people that have what you want. And not only what you want, but have the lifestyle that you want, have the values that you look up to. Because if you just go after somebody that has the accolades, that has the accomplishments that you want, but they don't have the lifestyle, they don't maybe have that value system that you're looking for, it's not going to work. I say seek out mentors that are the kind of people that you want to become like. And one of my mentors was such an impact in my life that my wife and I, when we were deciding where to live, one of the biggest reasons why we chose to live in Scottsdale, Arizona, is because one of my mentors lived here. The closest man that was teaching me about business and marketing and life. And let me tell you, when it comes to mentorship, here's how it works. If you want the best mentors, you need to take on the fraternity model. Give expecting nothing thereof. Every mentor that I have recruited to mentor me, I didn't go up to them and say, hey, will you take me on? Will you take me under your wing? Will you show me what to do to get to the top? 
That's how most people do it. And, they, and it just causes that person who's already successful and busy to just back away. They go, oh, I don't have the time right now. I'm sorry, kid. But if you want to pull in that mentor, you figure out what's important to that person. Maybe what's their charity of choice. Maybe figure out how old are their kids and what are their kids into. Maybe figure out what does their spouse do and what value can you bring to that mentor. One of my mentors said, Sean, if you want to succeed in life, find people that have what you want and help them get more of it. And the laws of drafting will pull you up with them. And it's so true, these 22 individuals that have helped us cultivate my entire career is because I showed up in their lives and I said, what can I bring to you? What is the value that you are looking for? And I did the research ahead of time. I figured out what lit them up and I went after that. Now some of these individuals, it took years to get their attention. And that's why you have to give expecting nothing thereof. Some of these mentors have yet to do anything for me, and I continue to pour on the value for them. Why? Because I want to be close to people that have what I want. I want to see how they move. I want to see how they breathe. I want to see how they handle stressful situations. I want to see how they handle pressure when they lose it. When they, they feel the defeat, I want to look closely at human beings. And Fight Cat Faith is a ground for being mentored and mentoring. Because it's a pleasure to be able to get a call from Rob Riggs and be saying, hey, we would love to have you come present to our gentlemen. Because now, this is my ability to come back into your lives and say, here's what worked for me. Here's what can work for you. The mentor process is about having somebody showing you where to go and then sending the elevator back down for others who don't even have what you have. This is critical. There are people on your campus that are completely lost in life. Maybe they don't have a purpose. Maybe they don't even know why they're in college. And if you feel like you know what you're there for, if you feel like you know what to do in life, it's important to share that with others. But it's going to feel weird at first. It feels weird to be a leader. It feels weird to go into a group of people that you do not know and say, hey, I just have gone through some things and here are the lessons that I've learned. If it helps you, great. If not, no worries. And maybe they don't even get it. Maybe they don't even absorb it. But that's not your job to get people to absorb what you have to share. Your job is to give expecting nothing thereof. I have brought that motto into business when I'm working with my audience members. I know there are people in my life that I will only meet for the few minutes I'm up on stage. And I'm going to open up my vulnerabilities. I'm going to share things, mistakes I've made. I'm going to share the pains that I've gone through. I'm going to bear myself to them. Because I know that if anything I can share with them makes their life a little bit easier, then it is worth it. And so I want you to think about who in your life right now can you be a mentor to? Maybe those younger chapter members. Maybe there's somebody that's not even in the fraternity but it's in one of your classes. Maybe it's a friend or one of your parents. But who can you bring some mentorship to? Who do you see struggling? Because if you can reach out and be a mentor and take on that mentor mentality, you're going to feel a fulfillment that will be unmatched. Now, I've been a therapist now for 16 years. Gentlemen, I have counseled some of the biggest names in business, in politics. I've sat across the room from people that you know the names of. And I can tell you, when their life fell apart. It was the moment that their life just became about them. It's the moment they stopped thinking about what impact they could have on another human being. It's the moment they became obsessed with money. And I love money. Money is great, but it cannot be your ultimate driver. 
and we'll burn out with that. It's the moment they became all about the status, the titles, the scratch, the show, the toys. It's the moment they wanted all the accolades to be about them and have their whole world surround them. And the individuals that I help, it's the way I got them to, to make a change in their life, is I got them to see that there's two ways to feel good. And I want you to commit this to memory. There are two ways to feel good in life. There's something we call gratification. And we all know about gratification. Alcohol, food, drugs, casual sex with somebody you don't even know the name of. Right? That feels good instantly, right? And we think, wow, that felt great. Our ego gets ahead, or maybe some part of us feels like we're stronger or better. And gratification is so fleeting, gentlemen. If you chase a life in gratification, you're going to look back at some point and go, what have I done? What do I have to show? Gentlemen, there's another way. And this is hopefully not just a moment where you're hearing this, you know, alumni to you and just this, you know, room. I hope this is a turning point. And the turning point is when you learn that there's a better way to feel good. And I'm not here as some kind of moral police. I don't care what you do in your life. It's your life. But I'm offering you another option. Something that's going to not be fleeting. Something that's going to be lasting. And that's fulfillment. The opposite of gratitude. And fulfillment, I found, only comes through two ways. If you want to be fulfilled, you have to either be growing, your mind, your body, your spirit, or you have to be giving. You have to be contributing back to others and me. You have to be giving back to the planet, to the human race in some form. And I was excited to hear what you guys were up to at this event and hearing about all the different projects. Because that's about giving. And it doesn't matter how much you accumulate, nothing lasts and feels as good as giving back. So as you think about your future, I want you to think about what more can I do to fulfill myself? And you can tell when you're doing a fulfilling activity, whenever you're doing something that's not fleeting, it's not instant. Like when you read a book, it's not like this instant joy of like, scrolling Facebook, right? It's not like Snapchat, somebody's right here, right now. When you're reading a book, it takes an investment, right? When you're strolling up to a philanthropy, and you're putting hours of your time, that maybe you could be hanging out doing gratifying things, but instead you say, no, this, is, this isn't just about me. We want to give back. When you start doing things to contribute to others, or growing yourself, that's going to be a lasting pleasure. I've gone through this life, and I've gone through things that I wouldn't wish upon me. And I can tell you the way that I have survived is by my darkest hours. Is thinking about how can I give to others who are more challenged than me? How can I reach out to people that are lost? How can I make an impact? And I can tell you that as you become more successful, and you start getting thrown awards and accolades and money, and you start accumulating those things that are gratifying, it's going to be easy to drink your own Kool-Aid, to think you're amazing, and to put yourself on a pedestal. That is going to be so tempting. But I'm going to recommend you fight that temptation. I'm going to recommend that you keep making your life about something way bigger than you. You know, Rob, when he asked me to come here, he said, Sean, I really want to get on the importance of life purpose. One of my mentors sat me down about eight years ago now. I was shadowing him, and he asked me, he said, Sean, why were you born? He said, I think my mom and dad had sex. So he was dumb. He said, no. He said, no, why were you born? He said, to help people go through challenges, give them inspiration. Why were you born? So he just kept asking me this over and over until he came nauseating. I was so upset with this question. He just kept coming at me. Why were you 
born. And at some point, I got angry. I'm like, I didn't even care that I was born. You tell me, why was I born? Why were you born? Then I got quiet. And then the answer showed up. And I looked at it and I said, I was born to make this world of insecurity. And he said, yes, you were. He said he felt the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. And he said, Sean, if there was ever to be a person to be born into this world, to teach people that they do not need to be insecure, that we would all listen to as a human race, it would be you. And that feeling of knowing why you were born, it's incredible. Because every day I get up, my eyes open for the human race now. And I'm thinking about how I can get rid of insecurity from people's lives. But I know that you have insecurities. You are a human being. And insecurity is any time that you feel that you're not enough. You're not smart enough, you're not tall enough, you're not rich enough, you're not strong enough. Whatever it is that you're not enough, that's going to gnaw at you in life. You're going to feel it. Sometimes you're going to be all alone, driving a car late at night. It's going to be storming. You're going to have the radio on. and it's gonna, You're going to feel this wave of, God, what am I doing with my life? I don't even know why I'm here anymore. And you're going to have all kinds of negative voices showing up, telling me you're, you're not enough. And you're going to have to break that moment. You're going to have to break that moment with your life purpose. So that's why I challenge you, get that journal back out again. And start thinking about, why was I born? Because yes, there's a lot of speakers that go out on the circuit and talk about confidence and success. That's not what makes me unique. What makes me unique is the way I talk about insecurity in the body that I have and in my life story and my tools. You have things in your life. You have skill sets. You have talents. You have stories. You've gone through things. Things that if I looked at you, I wouldn't have a clue. That you can bring to this human race with your life purpose. Gentlemen, you have to get linked up with your life purpose. It will be fuel on the days that you want to quit. And I gotta tell you, if I'm being honest, I want to quit a lot. I mean, I have weeks where things are happening in business, Contracts fall through, promises are broken, things don't go as planned. I'm a big believer that more will go wrong in your life than will go right. But instead of getting upset about that, is preparing yourself for that. And not inter internalizing that and making that about your identity. Because the moment you identify with a loss, you become a loser. The moment you identify with a defeat, you feel like you're never going to get back on top. This is why you have to be very careful what beliefs you allow grow inside your mind. You have to be very careful by monitoring what are you thinking. You know, it's so easy to just kind of wander through life and, and never question yourself. But when you are beating yourself up, when you're telling yourself that you're not good enough, you're not going to make it, or you know, you're starting to listen to those outside labels of your critics, your cynics, your skeptics, when you start letting those haters' messages affect you, that's when you need to monitor yourself and say, whoa, 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 I'm not going to take this from myself. You know, most of you, if you talk to your friends the way you talk to yourself, you wouldn't have any friends. Because even though I know this room is filled with achievers, achievers, we are so hard on ourselves. And it's easy to beat ourselves up and, and look for our flaws, but we have to go against that brain. You have to spend your life listening and monitoring your own internal dialogue. Because life is going to be challenging enough. You cannot be your own biggest obstacle. This is why it's important to have mentors. Mentors are amazing because a mentor will call you out and say, hey, that's not how you talk to yourself. And they will lift you up. And it will be very rewarding as you mentor people. 
because you will see yourself in others. I do this all the time with my clients. When I work with executives, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and they come in and they have all these successful things under their belt. And they don't want anybody to know that they have insecurities. They don't want anybody to know that they have down days. But they share it with me. And it's my job to help them get back to their true north. Why, was, why were they born? What is their life purpose? So gentlemen, I tell you, you need to be a mentor and you need to get mentors. You need to have the mentality that you are giving and expecting nothing there of from these mentors. You need that vision to be so clear in your life. And you need to get other people on board with your vision, especially your chapter. I'm going to do a quick activity with you to show you what happens when you're not on the same page. Okay? I want you to pick a number, either a one or a five. One through five. So you're going to pick a number between one and one through five. Get that number. Don't tell anybody what it is. And I want you to turn to your neighbors at your table. Shake their hand the number that you have chosen. So if you take three, three shakes. And no matter what number they chose, stick to your number. Do that right now. I want to 
honor you with one last thing, Stephen. To help you rid yourself of insecurities. And as I share with you, your, your first temptation is going to be to blow it off. Yes, I know that. That's, that's simple. But let me tell you, gentlemen, when a master hears something that they know, they go, ah, thank you for the reminder. When an amateur hears something more than once, they go, I know that. You don't want to live like an amateur. You want to master things. So when you hear something that you already intrinsically know or core, that you're not doing anything about, thank whoever that is that's being the one to remind you. Gentlemen, the cure to insecurity I have been seeking out for years, well over two decades. I've studied the best, and I've looked at why are some people insecure and others are not? And why does insecurity show up at some time in our lives and not others? And then I got a very clear idea of what insecurity is. Insecurity is like a cancer cell. We all have cancer cells in our body, but not all of us get cancer. Sometimes we do things in our lifestyle that activates that cancer, and then other times it never gets activated. Insecurity is no different. All of us have things inside of us that if it's triggered, we feel like we're not enough. We go down that negative spiral where we start questioning our own abilities. And I want to teach you this one cure to insecurity that will help you not to activate your insecurities. It will help you go into any scenario feeling solid. And most people overlook this, but I've seen it in the best of the best. The cure to insecurity is self-care. The cure to insecurity is self-care. And I've known this for years, but I didn't, I didn't draw the conclusion. I was like, what, what, what does that even mean? Well, the people that take great care of themselves, of their mind, their body, their spirit, the people that have a very clear list of rituals that they do to take care of their mind, their body, their spirit, the people that are very clear on what they need to do to make their life work, and then they stick to that, they're the ones that you can't bounce around. They're the ones that don't question themselves. The people that do not take good care of themselves, that do not do the internal work, they're the ones that feel the most insecure. I've seen this in my own life when I am neglecting my health, when I am neglecting my relationships, when I am neglecting nurturing my mind. I feel vulnerable to attack. But when I do the incredible self-care work, and I have in my office, I have a list of 16 activities. And I only need to do four of them a day to feel unstoppable. And these activities are customized to me. You can put together your own list. I call my list the When Life Works list. And when Sean's life is working, he's picking at least four of these 16 activities. And they're very simple, gentlemen. They're things like hydrating, keeping the body moist. It's things like exercise. It's things like spending time with my mentors. It's things like mentoring my apprentices. Spending time with my niece and nephew. It's about creating content and putting it out into the world. It's about spiritually connecting and meditating and praying. Whatever it is for you, you've got to look at that list. What are the things that when you do them, your life just works? Because there's this other list that you have that you spend way too much time in probably. And that's called the When Life Sucks list. And when you are on your When Life Sucks list, you're doing the things that may be gratifying, but they don't fortify your confidence. I was a real interesting bird in college. Because I got the, the personal growth bug at about 19 years old. I started studying personal growth and psychology and success principles. And I was the weird boy in the chat that had a journal and wrote down my feelings and questioned my thoughts and wrote out my goals. And I remember one day, one of my fraternity brothers that we later expelled because he was a 
Tuesday. Anyway, <laughs> he stole my journal. And he made fun of my goals. And he was like, this is stupid, son. You're a freshman in college. What are you doing saying that you want to work in the White House? What are you doing saying you're going to be a best-selling author? What are you doing saying you're going to be paid thousands of dollars to speak on stages around the world? You're in college. What are you talking about? And he was teasing me. And he later was kicked out of the fraternity for other reasons, but I think that his own insecurities of seeing somebody with a very clear vision for their life made him uncomfortable. Gentlemen, when you are very clear with your plan of how you want to be treated and what you expect in your life, you're going to make people that are insecure very uncomfortable. But that's about them. Don't let that lock you off your center. Don't let, you, don't let that have you put that journal away. Don't hold your head low and go, wow, okay, I guess working on yourself is stupid. And, okay, I'll just fit in so I can get everybody to like me. No, stand up and say, yeah, I do plan out my goals. Yeah, I do have a post for the things that I want in my life. Yeah, I do have a my life works list and I stick to my activities. Yeah, I do hit the gym. Yeah, I do get back and be philanthropy. Yeah, I'm building a future. Because the people that will tease you for working on yourself, they're the same individuals that 30 years later are just exactly where they are now. Gentlemen, it's the vision that matters. It's the mentorship. It's the self-care. It's staying humble and knowing that you're here for service. The moment you think your life is just about you, you're going to be lost and vulnerable to attack. But when you connect to a higher power, when you connect to a bigger reason for why were you born, nothing will be able to take you down. So there I am in the South Lawn. The presidential helicopter door swings open. The President of the United States steps out and he looks at me and he says, Charlie, good to see you, buddy. <laughs> I said, Mr. President, how are you? He said, Charlie, would you like me to push you into the White House today? I said, oh, Mr. President, that would be an honor. Now, what I didn't tell you, gentlemen, is the whole time that I was out on the South Lawn, I could see my superior in the window, banging on the window, going, John, no! I said, Mr. President, that's my boss. And he went, John, oh, hey, buddy. <laughs> now the President of the United States is wheeling me back towards the South Lawn. And as if by magic, those doors swung open, and I heard, ba da 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 Never make an apology for knowing clearly what you want. Rid yourself of anybody who can't get on the same page with you on what matters the most. Surround yourself with people that you want to be like. And bring people with you. Send the elevator back down. Help your underclass, your underclass in your campus. And those people as you graduate and you come back as alumni, mentor them. Take people under your wing. Help those that are struggling. Nothing will be more fulfilling. And when you create a life of fulfilling, fulfillment, you will have an endless sense of joy that no one can take from you. Gentlemen, it's been my pleasure and privilege to spend this evening with you. Thank you very much.